Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about North Korea and their relationship with one thing that is more volatile than even they are. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself. Nope, not him. Today we're talking totally unpredictable. Bitcoins quadrupled just since October. Yes, there we go. North Korea and Bitcoin in one video. This couldn't get more clickbaity if I had definitive proof Trump was a Muslim. Before we talk about the implications of this, we need to understand what Bitcoin is, besides expensive. Because it has many features that make it uniquely good for a country like North Korea. The specific ones we'll be talking about today are how it's made, how it's traced, and how it can be stolen. Well, now that I said that, that's pretty much every aspect of a currency short of value. So let's start with how it's made. This year, the regime in Pyongyang has been reported to have started its own Bitcoin mining. Unlike most currencies that are printed out by a treasury, Bitcoin is mined, giving North Korea a distinct advantage from their citizens' decades of experience mining. I kid, but this decentralization allows anyone anywhere to create a currency with value. And considering that North Korea's won is about one one thousandth of a dollar, being able to create a currency actually worth more than the paper it's printed on would be huge. Another key advantage to Bitcoin mining in North Korea is that it gives them something they can export. Considering that nowadays their exports are about as diverse as a confederate march because they were comprised of 35% selling coal to China. Although that recently hit a wall when China banned the use of burning coal domestically and even a major blow to Pyongyang's lifeline for its struggling economy, China blocking all coal imports from North Korea on Sunday for the rest of the year. Wow, that's like a parent refusing to buy lemonade from their kid's lemonade stand. While Bitcoin is very volatile, it does have consistent demand and no shipping costs. Now you might be thinking to yourself, how could North Korea mine Bitcoin? Doesn't that require electricity and internet, not to mention a computer with any processing power? I mean, I imagine it's hard for Kim to mine Bitcoin when his dial-up keeps disconnecting every time he wants to make a phone call to threaten the West. They actually have fine internet though for the very few people who have the privilege to access it. Also, now that China is not buying their coal, they have quite a bit of electricity to burn. Lastly, the problem of computers. Now, Many would think that North Korea is a country that couldn't get that kind of server farm to produce bitcoins, but look at their nuclear program. This brings us to point number two, how it's traced because it's an anonymous currency. Uh, it can easily bypass any sort of sanctions because there are none on Bitcoin. What does that mean it's an anonymous currency? It's not like I sign all the money in my wallet like a check. In fact, if I had to guess, I'd say cash purchases were less traceable than online purchases. But apparently, that's not true. The question isn't so much about one small purchase, like a pack of gum, but rather large or consistent purposes, like weapons grade plutonium, or well, your morning pipe of meth. Unfortunately for movies, the age of paying for things with large suitcases of cash isn't as popular as it used to be. So now, if you wanted to give someone more than a few thousand dollars, a bank is probably going to be involved, which means that you're going to have to go through the pain of laundering that money. Okay, so it might get a little confusing, but here's the exact example of how fellow traveler, the creator of Open Transactions, describes Bitcoin transactions. If you go to the bank and withdraw a hundred dollars, and then give that money to a prostitute, and then she gives it to a pimp. And then he gives it to his drug dealer, and his drug dealer goes and puts it back in the bank. What does the bank see? They see that you withdrew a hundred dollars from your account, and that the drug dealer deposited a hundred dollars into his account. But what they can't see is that that's the same hundred dollars. Digital cash does the same thing. First off, great example to give your currency credibility. You couldn't use maybe buying cookies instead. The more confusing issue here though is that that's exactly just describing what most people would imagine an ideal untraceable transaction to be, and they'd be right, begging the question, why not just deal in cash? Well, 
While cash works great when you're soliciting sex from prostitutes, it's limited in its abilities when not making face-to-face -face transactions. Let's say for example I live in Los Angeles and North Korea wants to pay me to hack people's computers. If I hop on the next flight to Pyongyang, grab my cash briefcase with a million dollars in it and then head back to the US, I'm probably going to have a few problems. First, buying a plane ticket to Pyongyang alone raises more red flags than a Soviet invasion. And second, what am I going to do with all that cash? If I put it in a bank or start making large purchases, people are going to notice. Conversely, if North Korea tries to wire me money, that's going to make it about as far as a North Korean destroyer entering international waters. Hence, Bitcoin, which can be moved from one account to another without record of where it's going or where it's coming from. Now to the third feature, how can it be stolen? Fox News reported, After careful investigation, the United States is publicly attributing the massive WannaCry cyber attack to North Korea. We do not make this allegation lightly. We do so with evidence, and we do so with partners. Great music choice, Fox News. Man, the Venn diagram of Fox News viewers who like dubstep has got to be all of one person. Anyways, for those of you who don't remember the WannaCry hackings, it was a series of cyber attacks that began on May 12, 2017, in which North Korea exploited a security flaw in Microsoft Word. Because apparently the internet is so dangerous that even Microsoft Word needs its own security. And what they did was they locked people out of their data and they charged people Bitcoin to get their data back. And if that's not bad enough, it would delete your data once you paid. It spread to every continent by infecting 300,000 computers across 150 countries. They've also attempted to directly hack people's computers to steal Bitcoins, but that hasn't worked out too well for them yet. It turns out that people who actually understand and own bitcoins also tend to be pretty tech savvy. Who could have guessed? Although they are still successfully hacking bitcoin trades between a few companies. So there you have it. Bitcoins are huge for North Korea as an export and a method for getting around sanctions. With these great new prices, it's no surprise that North Korea is going bitcoin crazy. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of That's All I Have to Say About That, click here. Please like and subscribe, and if you're really